from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston. It's the Cube, covering IBM Think. Brought to you by IBM. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Cube's coverage of the IBM Think 2020 Digital Event Experience. My name is Dave Vellante. Manish Chavla is here. He's the Global Managing Director for Chemicals, Petroleum, and Industrial Products at IBM. Manish, thanks so much for coming on the Cube. How are you doing out there? Saratoga, California, all good? I'm doing great, I'm doing great, given considering everything they're all full of us. Yeah, I mean, with. right, it's tough times, but look, we can still, you know, have a smile every now and then, right? I mean, I know it's exactly. very tough times for a lot of people and our hearts go out to, to everybody there. Um, so I, I, I want to start off, you, one of the areas that you're steeped in is the energy sector, you know, generally right. people are very much concerned about oil, price of oil, you know, drop below, you know, zero went negative, people were paying people to, to take oil. Now I understand that was a, a technical, but still the, the prices are depressed, people are concerned about credit risk and, and the like, but what's your take on what's going on in the energy sector right now? Yes, yeah, so, so I think uh, the companies that, uh, that have taken on a lot of debt uh, and don't have a stable operating conditions will naturally suffer through this uh, in the oil industry. Uh, clearly until the prices come back, which I expect will be, as demand picks up, that could be several months uh, to, to more than that. As we can imagine, uh, we'll see the, the more stable companies, the more, I'll say, uh, companies that have a stronger balance sheet survive through this, uh, for sure. Uh, in addition, you know, the, the other aspect of it is, of course, they're all double down on making sure the oil companies and the oil field services companies are double down on productivity, conserving cash, as well as considering how they accelerate, uh, in my view, their transition uh, to more more profitable uh, areas of growth as demand comes back. Manish, is there is there a silver lining here? I mean, in, in normal times, you know, of, of the oil price drops, it, it, uh, it's like a tax cut. Um, I know the government, uh, the United States government anyway, has been beefing up its strategic reserves. It has a history of buying low. Yeah. I mean, is there any good that you see coming out of this? So, so I think uh, the good that will come out is, uh, is surely that the stronger companies uh, will come through uh, more successfully. The companies that have taken less risk, the companies that have, that have invested in more, uh, uh, more stable operating platforms, uh, and, uh, and at the end of the day, I think the companies that have taken a more future-proof strategy uh, for their business portfolio, so whether you take a, a BP, for example, or a Shell uh, that are actively working towards supporting the energy transition, I think that'll be the, uh, so you'll see an acceleration of companies starting to think of where they need to go in the future to, to support uh, the energy transition, I think the silver lining at the end of the day will be uh, that as, as is sometimes just said, oil uh, is a very precious resource, therefore should not be burned. Uh, and, and so the question at hand is, you know, what do you do with, uh, with all the oil that's available? What do you build out of it, whether it's petrochemicals, et cetera? So I think that transition to a more future-proof product portfolio and business model will be, uh, will be truly the silver lining. How about the broader industrial companies that, that you follow? Uh, I mean, they were sort of moving down a path of digital transformation. Uh, IOT obviously is a big theme within many industrial sectors. What, what are you seeing in the broader? So I think uh, in the broader base, clearly, you know, supply chains under stress, um, uh, clearly, you know, demand, uh, demand dropping, prior demand signals, uh, which, which were sometimes ignored for historical reporting. Uh, that uh, that is now becoming more important, i.e. a sense and response supply chain. So as you step back and look at, at uh, the need to maintain business continuity is of course the highest priority. Uh, but as they come out uh, of this, we expect that, and we're thinking of this as, as the future for industrial sector will be what we would call as hybrid, i.e. You know, supply chains will need to be local and global. Uh, manufacturing will need to be both traditional uh, as well as additive. I, you know, you you produce more more locally, uh, and in addition, you know, uh, products and services will need to be a combination of digital and 
and physical. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you step back, I, I saw something uh, recently that said, uh, you know, who's leading the digital transformation in your company? Now, the uh, multiple choices were uh, the CEO, the CDO, uh, CIO, or is it, and this option was circled, uh, COVID-19. So if you think of it uh, in simple terms, COVID-19 is creating the acceleration of digital transformation uh, because the only valid response uh, in, in my mind, as you look at these, uh, as these different hybrid models, is a consideration of technology being, being a fulcrum of, uh, of creating a future-proof uh, platform. So it, it would seem to me that the financial framework are going to change the, the, the notion of how you, you know, made money for the last 10 years is not going to be the way you make money going forward. Yeah. There's, there's likely to be some share shifts. In other words, those that figure out how to be profitable with this sort of new model perhaps could gain share efficiently and, and maybe you're going to see some share shifts in the, the, the industrials. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, so companies that are in uh, what we would call essential or critical industries uh, would definitely be the ones that, uh, that continue to grow. You take a simple example of, of petrochemicals companies, uh, companies that make, uh, make plastics as well as uh, chemicals that go into a variety of other applications. Uh, plastics, interestingly enough, is now uh, resurgent. Uh, and, and the reason it's resurgent is it's clearly it's supporting, uh, you know, hygiene, packaging, uh, medical packaging, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll see industries uh, that shift that way. Uh, if we step back and look at a broader, uh, you know, broader uh, study that was done actually uh, about 10 years ago by Harvard, which said the companies that survive a recession, I think it said about 9% of the companies actually flourish coming out of a recession. About 75% uh, take three years to recover. And, and the remainder, which, uh, which if, I think if you do the math is about 17, 18%, uh, do not survive uh, through, through such a recession. Now the ones that thrive uh, through uh, had a dual focus on both the customer experience and customer engagement and shifting to areas of higher value, i.e. thinking of what they should be doing and how they should be doing, uh, doing those things. And secondly, they also focused a lot on, uh, on operational improvements and whether that's supply chain, that's manufacturing, it's whether it's outsourcing, non-core function, it's automating, et cetera. But that dual focus on customer and operations uh, is, is the hallmark of a successful uh, outcome was, was, the, was what the study, uh, study determined. So I think that, that, that dual focus is what will be the uh, the prime hallmark as we come through this. Interesting. Now, of course, biology sort of got us into this this problem. Can can technology deal with some of these issues uh, and help us get out of this problem? And what specifically is IBM doing in this regard? Yes. So uh, we've uh, we've identified seven areas of uh, of focus as we think of of coming out of this crisis, and we've referred to those seven areas of of uh, of focus as being are emerge stronger areas of focus. Uh, the ones that I think are relevant are including new ways of working, uh, cyber resilience, uh, thinking of extreme automation, automation and intelligent workflows, um, uh, thinking of, uh, of making sure that uh, we are aiding our clients with having more, uh, you know, more uh, systems that are available on demand, helping them create platforms and, and applications that can work uh, regardless of a location, uh, at the end of the day, we step back. Uh, the three three areas of focus that we see will be new new ways of working and supporting virtual working or remote working. Uh, extreme automation when industrial companies come back to work. Safe distancing uh, is going to be the norm, as well as allowing for for the fact that you want to be you want to be prepared for the next crisis. Uh, therefore, extreme automation, whether that implementing robots in factories uh, or, or implementing solutions that guide to you know, worker safety, uh, workers being close together, uh, as well as supporting customer uh, engagement uh, or, or customer experiences being digital, putting that extreme automation layer through so that, uh, so that the reliance and the ability to, to operate without 
of workforce uh, becomes far more important. So I think it's really that acceleration that we expect uh, we'll be able to support our clients with uh, as, as they come out of this and as they, as they adapt to the next normal. Do you see software robots as being a part of that sort of automation trend, you know, RPA and the like? For sure, that, that's an important part, especially in, uh, you know, in back office functions. Uh, that will be software robots, and I think layered on top of that, when you apply AI, uh, then you'll have AI augmenting a lot of professionals, uh, whether it's chatbots in customer call centers or technical uh, service centers, uh, or, or or it's a far a greater increase in, in automation uh, on on processes that could be automated, uh, but then AI would would uh, support uh, the rest that can't be simply automated but need uh, intelligent support as well. So if I go back to your you know, the Harvard study, I, the last thing I want to be, if I'm on a board of industrials is in your 17%, I either want to be in the 9%, right. which if I'm well positioned right. right now, I maybe have an opportunity to do so, uh, but if not, I'm in that fat middle. And I really want to be able to, to, to come out of this stronger, even if it may, might take a couple of years. So my question is, it's, it, well, it seems like companies are going to have to, at least in the near term, potentially sacrifice profitability in order to gain that sort of business continuance business resiliency that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, can, they, can they have their cake and eat it too? In other words, can they maybe take a near-term hit on profitability, but can they ultimately right. become more successful and more profitable, uh, maybe using data? Uh, data would be one thing. I think uh, the, the other part of this will, uh, will, using data, for example, to predict demand, to forecast uh, where, where the puck is going, uh, and and the use of data on on a monthly basis is going to be inadequate clearly right uh, uh, getting more more capability for real time demand sensing uh, to create platforms that allow us to allow uh, companies to understand uh, where needs are emerging so that they can pivot their uh, uh, their product portfolio accordingly uh, collaborating with customers uh, in in a far more, I'll call it co-create, crowdsourced way, uh, would create more resilient uh, customer relationships that come out in the future as well. Uh, and and at the end, I think there'll be also an element around asset light strategies, uh, which requires partnering with OEMs, suppliers, etc., uh, which then allow data to be the foundation where where you can essentially say, I'm using this much of this capability versus I'm investing in uh, insignificant uh, uh, capital outlays. So when I talk to executives, uh, I'm hearing consistent themes. We, we very much are concerned about the health and well of our, of our employees, getting remote right. work from home infrastructure going. Once we ensure that they're healthy, we want to make sure that they're productive, um, getting, staying close to customers for sure, making sure costs are, are in line because there's so much uncertainty but not a lot of time right now is being spent on, you know, sort of the, the long-term strategic aspect of the organization. Right. That maybe will come back slowly. So what advice are you giving to organizations right now in, in this situation? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest focus would be, as I think Winston Churchill said this, uh, never waste a good crisis. Uh, so so considering, considering that as being the backdrop, uh, uh, these are the these are times when when recognizing what would be the sources of value, uh, make, like I said before, making sure the you know the dual focus is kept in mind. Apart from of course uh, employee uh, health and safety and engagement, uh, then then in addition to that, uh, keeping in mind that uh, the localization of supply chains will need to be a, a big topic. Keeping your uh, as they say powder dry for for the opportunity to acquire uh, and, and merge uh, would also be an element. Uh, start considering how you reconfigure your supply chain. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, another important element would be uh, making sure that you are, uh, you as you come out of this, don't lose sight of sustainable development, uh, as well as you go back to, to think of, um, the fact that since digital will be an important uh, fulcrum to come out the other end, apart from the other elements we talked about, uh, that you start to prioritize those digital transformation programs that focus on both operations and supply chain as well as customer engagement. 
and that becomes a key focus and no longer just driven by, let's say, the straight business case, but also assisting and aiding uh, the resilience to come out and deal with future crises uh, as well. So Manish, many of those things that you just mentioned might have been kind of culturally challenging for a lot of organizations prior to COVID, but in a way, organizations kind of get a COVID mulligan or the CEO, you know, the boards of directors might have felt like, okay, we had to make some changes, but we got to be careful. Now, with COVID being such a disruptor, uh, organizations can really drive forward and set up for the next decade. Bring us home. What are your final thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, boards and CEOs have to have to really think of this in stages and and start to, of course, the initial the the start of this crisis was not uh, not planned. Uh, but recognizing that this the recovery will occur in stages, uh, so we think of it as respond, which is where most companies are. The next stage being, uh, you know, being uh, being uh, recover, uh, which is getting started back up, uh, dealing with demand and so on. Uh, and the third stage being reinvent. I think boards and CEOs need to start putting perhaps three work streams in place around these three different uh, time horizons, and keep that uh, keep that planning in place so that they can effectively uh, work through recovery while they have a separate stream that's focusing on the reinvent, so that they're more resilient and they're more prepared and they are able to take, in, take advantage of both uh, the opportunities as well as uh, creating a more resilient company for the future. Manish, great insight and, and awesome advice. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. You're very welcome. And thank you for watching everybody. We're seeing the pattern emerge where we're not just going to go back to the last decade, we're really going to have to prepare for the next decade, business resiliency and business continuance and flexibility. It's a whole new world, folks. This is theCUBE covering IBM Think 2020, the digital event. We'll be right back right after this short break. <laughs>